Hey guys, welcome to the next video on data structures and algorithms. In the last video, I have given you an introduction about complexity analysis. And this video will be a continuation of that video. So I will highly recommend you to watch the last video and then come to this video. In this video, we will see how we can perform low level analysis of an algorithm. So we have already learned that an efficiency of an algorithm is the number of basic operations or primitive operations. Now these primitive operations are the basic computation performed by an algorithm. These primitive operations are identifiable in pseudocode easily and we have already learned how we can write the pseudocode. Now largely these primitive or basic operations inside an algorithm are independent from the programming language or the machine or the compiler. So examples of primitive operations can be evaluating an expression like this where x, y and the value of c is known. So we will be able to evaluate this expression or assigning a value to a variable. So let's say we define a variable called count and then we want to increment the value of count by one. So to increment this value, we need to add one to it and then we need to assign this value to the count variable again. So assigning a value to a variable is also considered as a basic or a primitive operation. Now the next primitive operation can be indexing into an array. So if you want to index some element from an array, then it's considered to be a basic operation. For example, uh, if an array contains 10 elements and if you want to access the element at the index 5 because index starts from 0, right? So if you want to access the element at the index 5 then you can access it like this and it's also called a primitive operation. Now calling a function, so let's say you define a function and if you call this function it's also considered as a primitive operation or returning from a function. So if you uh, write a function and if you are returning something from a function then also it's called a basic or a primitive operation. Now based upon our knowledge about the primitive operations, we can perform the low level algorithm analysis. And as I said, this analysis will be independent of programming language or the machine on which we are doing this algorithm analysis. So for doing this low level algorithm analysis, we count the number of basic operation inside an algorithm. So for example, when we make an addition, it will be considered as one operation. When we call or return from a function, it will be also considered as one operation. So we will count the number of basic operation which will be performed inside an algorithm to have an idea about the behavior of time when the input is changed and it's changed to a larger value. So in the last video, I have shown you how you can write an algorithm to find out the maximum value inside an array. Now, if you want to count the number of basic or primitive operations inside this algorithm, we will be able to do it like this. So let's go line by line and let's count the number of basic operations this algorithm is going to be performing. So in the first line, we are performing two basic operations. First is assigning the value of array at index zero to the current maximum variable. So this is one operation. And we are also indexing the zeroth element of an array. So this is the second operation. So that's why the number of basic operations performed on this line is equal to 2. Now let's go to the next line. 
So if you have written any kind of loop or a for loop in any language, you already know before even starting the for loop, we assign the value of i and we do comparison between end and i. So these are two basic operations. So that's why we have written two here. And then after the first iteration, the only thing which will be performed on this line will be the comparison between the n and i. And this comparison will happen n times. So before starting the for loop, there will be two basic operations. And then we are comparing n with i n times. That's why we have written n here. Now let's go to the next line. So here we are comparing the value of a at index i with the current value. So this is one basic operation. And then we are also indexing the value of a. So this is two operations. So that's why we have written two operations here. And because we are iterating from 1 to n minus 1. So this if condition will be evaluated n minus 1 times. Now in the next step, we are also performing two basic operations, which is indexing the value of array at index i and assigning the value to the current max. So that's why this is 2. And we will perform this operation n minus 1 times because we are iterating inside a for loop. So that's why the number of basic operations performed here is 2 multiplied by n minus 1. Same in the next line. So before going to the for loop and evaluate the value of i and n, the for loop increments the value of i by the number which you write here inside the for loop. So in this case, we are incrementing the value of i by 1, let's say. So the incrementing or adding 1 to i is one basic operation. And then we are reassigning this 1 plus i to the i. So this is the second basic operation. And this will happen n minus 1 times inside the for loop. That's why it's also 2 multiplied by n minus 1 operation. And at last, when we come out of this loop and we return the maximum value using this function, this is also one operation. So let's count. So how many number of n we have? We have n plus 2n plus 2n plus 2n. So 7 n's and we have some constant value also. So, so 2 plus 2 plus 1 is equal to 5 and we are just minusing minus 6 because 2 multiplied by 1 is equal to minus 2 minus 2 minus 2. So minus 6 plus 5. That's why we have minus 1 remaining here as the constant. So we have already counted that algorithm for array max function executes 7 and minus 1 primitive operations. So if we define a is equal to the time taken by the fastest primitive operation and B is equal to the time taken by the slowest primitive operation. So let's say Tn will be the actual running time of the algorithm which we have written inside this method. Then we can say that A multiplied by 7n minus 1 will be lesser than or equal to Tn and that value will be lesser than and equal to b multiplied by 7n minus 1. So this value. So therefore, the running time tn will be bounded by these two functions, a multiplied by 7n minus 1 and b multiplied by 7n minus 1. Now, as we already learned that to evaluate an algorithm or to compare two algorithms, we focus on their relative rate of growth with respect to the increase in the input size, right? So growth and input size is important terms here. So let's compare the growth rate of 
some operations for example the linear operation or a quadratic operation or a cubic operation where n is the number of primitive operations so our algorithm which we have written for the maximum array function will be a linear algorithm because it contains n iterations and generally we remove the constants from our number of iterations so that's why it's nearly equal to n right because it was 7 and minus 1 and we have removed the constant uh, 1 and 7 from our algorithm so it's nearly linear now if you see on the right hand side on this graph in this log log chart the slope of the line corresponds to the growth rate of a function so this green line is for the linear function this red line is for the quadratic function and this line is for the cubic function and most important concept to take from this graph is how our time grows with the input size now it's important to note here is that our growth rate is not affected by constant factors or lower order terms that's why in our algorithm when we counted 7 and minus 1 primitive operations that means we have removed 1 and also we have removed 7 from our count because the constant factors and lower order terms doesn't affect our growth of time with the larger input size so let me give you some examples so let's say an algorithm takes 102 multiplied by n plus 105 basic or primitive operations and if you see on this graph for the smaller input this line is constant here you can see and then for the larger input size this line is similar to the linear line so at the bigger input size the constant factor or the lower order terms doesn't even matter the behavior of the time will be same at the larger input as the linear function let's take next example so if an algorithm takes 105 n square so this is not multiplied by 2 but it's a square plus 108 multiplied by n then it's called a quadratic equation why because we generally take the higher order terms so in our first example the higher order term is this term and we just remove the lower order terms and the constant factors so the only thing which remains in this expression will be n and the only thing which will remain in this expression will be n square we generally take the higher order term which will be n square and at the larger inputs this will also behave like this so at larger input it will behave as a quadratic function and at the larger input size the constant factor and the lower order terms will not affect the behavior or the growth rate of this curve and that behavior leads us to the asymptotic notations so what are asymptotic notation or asymptotic analysis the asymptotic analysis of an algorithm refers to defining the mathematical foundation of its runtime performance so for the asymptotic analysis which we will learn in the next video and the details about the asymptotic notations like big o notation big theta notation or big omega notation what are these notations and how we can use these notations we will learn in the next video so stay tuned and i will see you in the next video